Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Erkin, and welcome you to our Friday morning uh, virtual journal club. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing two renowned head neck pathologists who will provide us with um, tremendous insight into the incredibly important and often confusing world of thyroid pathology. Um, if I can just um, uh, digress for just a moment and say that the relationship between the surgeon and pathologist as well as endocrinologist and, path and pathologist is quite unique. I would say that during my career, I would have, um, I have been extremely fortunate to have worked with two world-class head and neck pathologists in Bruce Wenig and Margie Bramwine. Um, I think it's an interesting dynamic as I reach a point in my career where I have the opportunity to reflect back. And as a surgeon, uh, we are used to taking control of situations and taking full responsibility for the lives of patients during surgery. However, um, that role uh, sort of takes a back seat with a minute we walk into the frozen section room um, in order to engage uh, or to engage in post-operative conversations with our pathology con uh, colleagues. And at that point, the control is given up and the final word on a patient's condition is really in the hands of the individual who we entrust to give us answers about what they are seeing under the microscope. The important thing for clinicians um, and especially for surgeons is to um, feel that, there, that this is an important uh, partnership and that the merger of clinical information with histologic information is really a vital integration of sometimes disparate sets of facts. And it's imperative that that dialogue the, uh, which ensues takes the shape of a partnership with a common goal of trying to arrive at the truth about the biology of a patient's disease process. And so when I um, seek uh, when I uh, seek to give guidance to young surgeons who are um, interested in making either their first or a career move, I advise them that one of the most important variables that they must consider is the expertise and the culture related to the surgeon pathologist interaction. And it's important to recognize that the trust of a surgeon and in the information they receive from their pathologist is absolutely vital to the level of con confidence that we have in embarking on the plan of care of each individual patient. And so with that, it's truly a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Virginia Labosi, who is our invited speaker this morning. She is an absolutely world-renowned head and neck and thyroid diagnostic pathologist who has spent uh, the vast majority of her illustrious career at the University of Pennsylvania, where she has held a number of leadership positions, including head, and head of surgical path, as well as director of anatomic pathology. She has been a prolific author of peer-reviewed articles, um, chapters, and textbooks, um, and a textbook entitled Surgical Pathology of the Thyroid. Um, she has also held numerous leadership positions, including president of um, the U.S. College of, Ameri of Anatomic Pathologists, the author, the author Purdy Society, Stout Society of Surgical Pathologists, and the Endocrine Pathology Society. Um, it's important to note that many of her students have assumed leadership positions in departments of pathology throughout the world. Um, our discussant this morning is a long-term colleague, Dr. Margaret Bramwine, who is um, the site chief of pathology at Mount Sinai West and director of head and neck pathology fellowship. I've had the distinct pleasure of working with her at various points in my career. Um, as our careers have unfolded, she has chosen to leave and then come back at various points. And uh, we have collaborated on numerous research projects over the course of um, our, our combined careers. Okay. Her unwavering desire to seek the truth, as well as her willingness to be transparent in what she is able to say and not say about a patient's condition is absolutely invaluable. Margie has served as in numerous leadership roles throughout her career, including president of the North American Society of Ethnic Pathology and the Consensus Committee of the WHO. Recently, she served on the expert panel of the eighth edition of the American Joint Committee on Cancer Staging System, um, so if any of you have any questions, concerns, or um, uh, disagreements, uh, you can direct them directly to her. And finally, she is widely published, including three dis um, separate textbooks on head and neck pathology, 
Uh, and uh, most recently, she is also currently an investigator on an NIH-funded R01 uh, grant entitled a Quantitative Risk Model for Predicting Outcome and Identifying Structural Biomarkers of Treatment Targets in Oral Cancer. And so with that, I'm going to um, hand over uh, the podium to Dr. Lavolsi and to all of our participants. Uh, now is your time to um, seek answers to questions, and so I encourage you to uh, write in your questions, and I'm going to do my best to get to them at the very end here. So thank you. Okay, what I wanted to do today was uh, not to talk about every subtype of thyroid cancer because that would take us till about tomorrow. Um, but I wanted to focus on two areas, aggressive tumor subtypes, and again, not all of them. And the second topic would be important clues that the pathologist can give to the clinician with regard to what he or she sees under the microscope that might be important clues to familial disease and syndromes. Now, aggressive thyroid cancers um, are a whole variety of things. The ones that I think are most important for the pathologist to recognize and to give this information to the clinician are papillary carcinoma subtypes, which behave aggressively. The other tumors on this list are relatively rare. And I noticed that Dr. Brandwein will be talking about high-grade differentiated carcinoma and probably poorly differentiated carcinoma. And in one of these journal clubs about several months ago, we talked about that. Herthel cell carcinoma, of course, anaplastic carcinoma and medullary carcinoma have their own categories. Sorry. So the subtypes of papillary carcinoma that have uh, a worse prognosis than usual when controlled for stage are tall cell papillary carcinoma, which I'm going to spend the most time on, columnar cell papillary carcinoma, diffuse sclerosis variant, which is a disorder of very young individuals, uh, including uh, children, the solid variant, which is, um, I think, came into its own after the Chernobyl nuclear accident, where a lot of the papillary carcinomas in the children were solid variant. Uh, it can occur in adults, and it might have, in adults at least, a somewhat more guarded prognosis. And then the relatively recently described hobnail cell variant and micropapillary variant. And in these different types of tumors, the prognosis appears to be worse than usual papillary carcinoma. Now, tall cell variant of papillary carcinoma, depending upon who you read and how they define it, makes up approximately 10 to 15% of all papillary carcinoma. It tends to occur in older patients and is very, very rare to occur in a patient under the age of 30. These tumors tend to be large um, in general and often show extrathyroidal extension into the muscle, so real extrathyroidal extension. About 20% of them at least will have vascular invasion either within the thyroid or in the immediate perithyroidal soft tissue. And it is estimated that there is approximately a 25% mortality at 10 years for this variant, which is really impressive if you think about all papillary carcinoma. It would be great if it were lung cancer. So the problem with tall cell variant of papillary carcinoma is what exactly is it from a pathology point of view? We know that the tumor cells tend to be large and various right uh, authors and students of, of thyroid cancer have defined large tumor cells and the, the number of times length versus width uh, in various ways. And so because you have various definitions, it becomes pretty impossible to get a whole bunch of pathologists, even so-called endocrine pathologists who concentrate on the endocrine system, 
to agree as to what a tall cell variant is. They tend to be extremely papillary and because they are so, the papillae fall in uh, upon one another and lead to what I'm going to show you, uh, a train track pattern of growth of this tumor. It is unusual to have tall cell papillary carcinoma show follicular differentiation. The nuclei may be clear or may not be clear, but they have inclusions. They have a lot of inclusions. And in cytologic preparations, you may guess that this might be a tall cell papillary carcinoma by the fact that some of the nuclei have inclusions. And this has been called by some as soap bubble looking cells. And they can have mitotic activity. Now here are two different cases of tall cell variant papillary carcinoma. On the left, you see some colloid, but you notice that the uh, cells are quite voluminous in their cytoplasm. And on the right, you see the train track growth of the uh, tall cell variant of papillary carcinoma. Notice that the individual cells are rather narrow, but they have a lot of cytoplasm. And most pathologists feel that there should be at least three times as long as it is wide. And here is a beautiful case of tall cell variant papillary carcinoma with an absolutely spectacular and perfect intranuclear inclusion. Uh, there are several other inclusions in some of the other cells. Those of you who are pathologists on the line can see them, I'm sure. So when we have tall cell variant papillary carcinoma, we do not necessarily have the whole tumor being tall cell variant. So you can have partial tall cell variant. And one then questions the meaning of recognizing small amounts of tall cell variant. Uh, what about recurrences and nodal metastases? Uh, over the years, I've seen a number of cases of tall cell variant of papillary carcinoma, which started out with a small, relatively small percentage of an otherwise papillary carcinoma showing tall cell growth pattern. In recurrences and nodal metastases, and subsequently um, hematogenous metastases, the percentage of tall cell increases. And tall cell variant is the most important variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma that can undergo dedifferentiation to anaplastic carcinoma. So the definition of tall cell. If you read the literature on this tumor type, it is replete with percentages needed to diagnose a tumor as tall cell carcinoma, anywhere from 10% to 70%. The WHO, agreed with Memorial Sloan Kettering, who said, if you have 30% or more of a tumor of a papillary carcinoma that has tall cell growth pattern, that should be called a tall cell papillary carcinoma. And the WHO agreed in 2017. The problem with tall cell variant, one of the problems is that it is under-recognized. And we did a study way back 10 years ago, looking at cases that were referred to our endocrine surgeons and endocrinologists for treatment of papillary carcinoma. At least in 40% of those cases, tall cell histology was not noted, especially if the tall cell features were only focal. And as I said, in recurrences or nodal metastases, there's often a larger percentage of tall cell histology. But it is also over-recognized. And some cases of Graves' disease, which have, can have oncocytic or even Herzl cell change, have been overcalled as tall cell variant papillary carcinoma. And it's not even a cancer. And as I've always said, beware of something called tall cell papillary carcinoma in any individual under the age of 18. Now, this is a very important study from Memorial, which defined tall cell uh, as having 30% tall cell cytology. And these tumors that either had 50% or more or 30% or more shared certain features, older age, large tumor, more extensive extrathyroidal extension, more positive resection margins, higher pathologic stage, lower survival, 
more nodal disease, and even extranodal extension, and risk of anaplastic uh, transformation. So they said 30% should be the cutoff. Now, uh, the problem is, do pathologists agree, even with the 30% cutoff and the lovely pictures that I showed you of tall cells? And so the problem is they don't. And this is a study uh, led by Bruce Wenig a number of years ago, and he got together 13 so-called endocrine pathologists and 39 cases of papillary cancer. And the overall strength was best when the pathologist used a definition of three times as tall as they are wide, and at least 50% of the tumor uh, was tall cell. But again, the kappa was not very good. And it is very, very important, in my opinion, to warn all clinicians, endocrinologists, and surgeons to understand that there is this variability in interpretation and lack of concordance so that you really have to, as Dr. Erkin had said earlier, you really have to know how to communicate with your pathologist who has to know how to communicate to you. Now, just as an aside, I think it's very, very important to realize that tall cell papillary carcinoma can undergo anaplastic transformation. And this, of course, is a very serious complication. And, uh, it's very interesting that the anaplastic carcinoma coming out of tall cell variant often has a spindle cell squamous appearance. Um, and there we found in our study that there were three clinical scenarios. One, you can have anaplastic carcinoma identified at the time of initial surgery for the tall cell papillary cancer. Pretty straightforward. Secondly, you could have anaplastic carcinoma in the recurrence or metastasis of the tall cell papillary carcinoma. And in our experience, the anaplastic transformation tends to occur in bone metastases more commonly than other sites. And then, and most importantly, for individuals who are head and neck surgeons, Anaplastic carcinoma is not identified and is misdiagnosed as squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, usually the larynx, after the diagnosis of papillary carcinoma long ago. And that tumor is long forgotten, both by the patient who was told after five years, you don't have to have follow-up on this anymore. And of course, the doctor doesn't remember the patient either. Uh, that is a very serious mistake in pathologic interpretation. Now, what about tall cell papillary carcinoma that's not very big? And this is a study that we are going to present at this year's annual meeting of the USCAP. Uh, we looked over an 11 year period of tumors that were microcarcinomas by, defined by size, over 1200 cases and two, over 200 of them were tall cell variant or had tall cell features in greater than 50%. And this small group showed statistically significant differences with greater risk of extrathyroidal extension, lymphovascular invasion, nodal metastases, so that even small tall cell papillary carcinomas behave more aggressively than classic or follicular variant counterparts. So there's something about the tall cell, and it's and a lot of people have studied a lot of things, and it's not really known what it is that makes this particular cytology histology so aggressive. We know that as compared to uh, a, about a 40% incidence of BRAF B600 E mutations in ordinary papillary carcinoma in North America. Tall cell variant has over 75% BRAF B600E mutation. That might be a reason for this type of aggressive behavior. Okay, so that's all I want to say about tall cell. Another aggressive lesion is the so-called columnar cell variant, originally described by Harry Evans from MD Anderson. And he described two men that had large tumors with extrathyroidal extension who were dead of tumor within four years of the original diagnosis. And he said this was a really aggressive variant. Fortunately, it makes up a small percent of papillary carcinoma, and it is very aggressive when it is extrathyroidal. 
Um, the region that is columnar cell, but which is confined within the thyroid, does have a more aggressive clinical course than ordinary papillary carcinoma of similar size, but it does not behave as aggressively uh, as, if it, as it does when it's extrathyroidal. This tumor is very distinctive histologically. It has a secretory look with stratification of the nuclei. And uh, for those of you who are pathologists, it can remind you of 17th day secretory endometrium. Here is a columnar cell variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. It's very papillary. And you can see the stratification of the nuclei in the right hand side of the photograph. Another unusual type and recently described is the so-called hobnail cell variant, which apparently uh, occurs predominantly in women like all thyroid cancers do. Uh, a little bit older in average age, modest size, 50% have extra thyroidal extension and 75% have positive lymph nodes and over a half of them are BRAF mutated. In the original study, 50% of the patients, and there were only eight, were dead of disease at three and a half years, and an additional two of the eight patients had persistent disease. And additional um, studies of hobnail variant recapitulate uh, these statistics. Now, what was interesting is that some of these hobnail cell variants have affiliated tall cell pattern in parts of the tumor. Again, these are large tumors. So if you take a lot of sections, you may in fact find some tall cell features. And here is the hobnail cell. The hobnail cell has what's called decapitation secretion. The, the tip of the cell looks like it's cut off and it falls into the lumen. Uh, this is very characteristic of this type of tumor. And again, if you have a tumor that is predominantly this type of tumor, it has a significant risk of bad outcome. Now, micropapillary carcinoma is very rare in the thyroid, but it is similar in its histology and in its behavior as the same type of tumor in other organs, such as the breast, the ovary, the bladder, or the stomach. These tumors do very poorly with over a 50% mortality at five years because they have early access to lymphatics and they disseminate widely. It is very interesting, and this is a pattern of such a, a tumor. These are an all in lymphatic spaces on the right hand side. Uh, this tumor, this portion of this a larger tumor, which was hobnail cell variant. So this hobnail cell can on occasion have micropapillary areas and those tumors really behave badly. So remember, it is not uncommon to have mixtures of tall cell with either columnar cell or hobnail cell variant. Usually tall cell is the majority of the lesion, but not always. Some examples of any of these tumors can have tumor necrosis, which to me indicates high grade, or as some would say, poorly differentiated carcinoma. And that takes it into a whole nother category and a really aggressive outlook. Let me go on quickly uh, with regard to follicular derived carcinomas that are part of syndromes, uh, especially in very young individuals. Now, if you have tumors that are uh, familial or have a genetic basis, whether they are a follicular cell or C-cell derivation, there are certain things that are characteristic. Number one, they tend to be young patients, usually under the age of 30, and often are pediatric patients. The gender incidence is equal. There may be a positive family history, not necessarily of thyroid cancer, but of thyroid nodules and or of thyroid surgery where nobody knows what the thyroid surgery showed. There may be a precursor lesion, and most importantly, they, these are multifocal and bilateral. Um, so if you talk about non-medullary familial thyroid carcinoma and those that are syndromic, the three major syndromes that one has to think about are familial adenomatous polyposis, Cowden or P10 mutated syndrome, and Dicer mutation associated thyroid lesions. 
probably the most important is familial papillary carcinoma associated with familial adenomatous polyposis and or Gardner syndrome. The overwhelming majority of these patients are young females, usually teenagers. They have a very characteristic appearance, which I will show you in a moment. And the important thing is that they are associated with colonic polyposis and the risk of colonic multifocal adenocarcinoma. So the thyroid cancer is not terribly a high risk, but the associated lesion obviously is. And here is a cribriform morial variant. It's papillary. It's got these funny looking squamoid round balls, which are the morioles. And here they are at higher power. And what's very interesting about this these tumors, in the familial cases, beta catenin, which is a protein which is found in thyroid cells, but in the cytoplasm, is translocated into the nucleus. And here you see a beta catenin stain on this case of cribriform morial variant in both the cytoplasm and the nuclei stain. Now, because they do not have a lot of thyroglobulin, some people have said they might not be true papillary carcinomas. As of now, they're still classified among papillary carcinomas. They show thyroid transcription factors quite avidly. Rarely, if ever, do they have colloid. And the nuclei are elongated, but usually don't have all of the features of papillary carcinoma nuclei. But the, the low power and medium power hist histologic pattern with the morules is characteristic. Now, Cowden syndrome is a syndromic familial syndrome characterized by breast and thyroid tumors and shows various mutations along the P10 gene, which is a huge gene. Its estimated incidence in the general population is one in 200,000. And the most important thing is the early age of onset of breast cancer. And uh, over 25 and up to 50% of females with this syndrome will develop breast cancer, often multifocal. The thyroid lesions can be both benign and malignant. The estimated risk of thyroid cancer is 10%. And the tumors are all of follicular derivation being follicular carcinoma, Herthel cell carcinoma, follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, and benign lesions such as follicular adenomas and multinodular voida. So the major criteria are breast cancer, thyroid cancer, endometrial carcinoma, and some funny developmental anomalies. There are a whole bunch of minor criteria, but the breast cancer and the thyroid cancers are the ones that you have to deal with. There are other syndromes which are more associated with neurological and developmental defects and mental retardation, and cancers in these syndromes are not as significant. Here is a case of Cowden syndrome. Often they have uh, benign nodules, which often, in my experience, are oncocytic or Herthel cell. Here's a case in which there was invasion uh, by the tumor of the capsule in this case, and here vascular invasion by that lesion. Many of the tumors are relatively low risk like this follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. And finally, DICER-1 mutations in thyroid tumor. This is an evolving story. DICER syndrome itself with germline mutation in DICER-1 have pulmonary blastomas, Sertoli latex cell tumors of the testis and ovary, and multinodular goiter with some showing papillary thyroid carcinoma. The, they also can have papillary hyperplasia, but the great majority of thyroid cancers are well differentiated and low risk, often small and encapsulated and without extrathyroidal extension, such as this. But sometimes you get a, a case and this is a Dicer syndrome patient who was 15 years old uh, and had multinodular goiter. He had one lesion, the top lesion, which was a papillary carcinoma, even with somoma bodies, and that had metastasized to a regional lymph node. But then he had this very cellular nodule. And I think that this nodule had a little bit of change in the nuclei to suggest that maybe it was somehow evolving from a papillary carcinoma into something else. 
This did not metastasize to the lymph nodes, but looked really funny and was very worrisome. This is unusual in a patient with germline dicer mutation. So uh, in sporadic papillary thyroid carcinoma in teenagers, one can, if you test them by molecular analysis, show dicer mutation in the tumor. So that's a somatic mutation. But recently, there was a multi-institutional study of six cases of poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma defined by the Turin criteria with necrosis, excess mitotic activity, et cetera. And these were all teenagers. Two of the six patients, when they were studied, were found to have germline changes suggestive of Dicer syndrome, although they did not have any of the other components. And here is such a case in a 16-year-old girl with a solid pattern of growth with, as this arrow shows, extensive necrosis. This was extrathyroidal and was uh, not completely resected. This is a recent case, so we don't know what's going to happen to her. She did not have any other manifestations of Dicer syndrome and was tested and her germline was normal. So this was a somatic mutation only. And in these six cases, there was a 50% mortality rate. So this is something that uh, is just becoming recognized, this Dicer mutation associated thyroid lesions. And there's a lot yet to learn. And we don't know all of the story, but I think it's going to become a major story, at least in pediatric thyroid disease. So I went over some aggressive variants of thyroid cancer and some important clues that the pathologist can give to the clinician to possible familial or syndromic diseases from the basic microscopy of the thyroid. Uh, and I will thank you and stop there. Margie. Okay. <clears throat> can you all see me? Okay. Good morning. Um, good morning, everybody. Mark, thank you again. Um, it's always a special honor and a lot of fun to present at these Thank Thyroid Journal Clubs. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, Dr. Lavolsi is a hard act to follow, um, but I will do my best. And what I'm going to do is discuss, um, give you some of my views on Tulsa variant of PTC, as well as discuss two other variants in her um, excellent review article, the solid variant of PTC and the so-called high-grade carcinoma. So we live with the reality of tall cell carcinoma every day when we sign out um, PTCs. And this, of course, is an aggressive histological feature and um, as a single focus, as a single feature can um, up upgrade uh, a tumor to at least intermediate risk by the ATA ROR. So let me start by showing you an interesting case. This was a 64-year-old man who presented with what ended up to be a PT1 N1 PTC. He had a um, multinodular goiter, and I'm showing you a lousy low power um, image of a hyalinized nodule. There was really nothing within this nodule that could be histologically identified as PTC, although of course the lesion could have arose from the sleep from from this hyalinized area. But um, I'm going to show you higher powers of this area here. And so what we see here is a viable and recognizable PTC, um, invasive, less than a millimeter, no extra thyroid extension, and certainly no tall cell component. He had one positive lymph node at the time of surgery, which was nine millimeters, and. Um, oof, can you see my arrow? Okay. Yes. So, um, great. So I want you to focus in on this area here. Um, I estimated at the time of surgery about 10 to 15% of, um, of tall cell within the single lymph node. And I reported it as such. So clearly this was a low risk case. The patient was being followed. And um, in February of 2019, he was found to have a, a rising thyroglobulin, but no evidence of structural disease. Um, radioactive iodine was given a month later based on this rising thyroglobulin. 
um, regional metastases um, were devel uh, developed um, approximately two years after surgery. And so um, he came to a section again, he had two positive central lymph nodes, the largest was just nine millimeters, no e and &E, and one uh, large retrocarotid lymph node, um, 3.4 millimeter uh, centimeters, likely e and &E. And so what I'm showing you now is the low power view of one of the central lymph nodes. And um, this is easily recognizable as a uh, tall cell. Altogether, it was more than 50% tall cells within this one um, lymph node. So this is an example that Dr. Lobolsi had discussed. Now I'm showing you another example of tall cell morphology that's acquired with disease progression. It led us to ask the question, could a non-tall cell primary PTC give rise initially to metastatic tall cells? And if so, how do we classify these tumors? So the prognostic importance of tall cell variant PTC is undisputed. The problem is in the application of this category. And so um, these four boxes basically summarize five relatively recent studies. The significance of these studies is, is that um, all, all of these studies had achieved statistical significance with regard to multivariate analysis. And multivariate analysis allowed for the conclusion that tallness um, is an independent variable, uh, independent predictor of disease recurrence. But take a look at the heterogeneity of definitions. In each of these five cases, there was a different definition applied with regard to the height versus width and the percent distribution. So what's a pathologist to do? And this is the question that was also um, uh, raised by Dr. Lavolsi. So we'll get back to this, to this question. Let's talk a moment about recognizing PTC. And um, this is one of the, of the patterns that has been um, discussed in the literature, the train tracks or the tram tracks. And so you see these long tubules, or we call them snakes, these long snakes of uh, tumor cells. Now, you have to go high power to make sure that they are all of tall cell, because they, you can have this pattern and the tumor cells are not all tall. Here we have a, um, an area that shows you that predominantly in this area, uh, these tram tracks are composed of tall cells. There's another pattern that I'd like to highlight that has not been um, discussed in the literature, and that's one that we call, for lack of a better word, hypercomplexity. And this is something that comes out of a study that um, Shabnan, um, uh, Shabnan Samarkhan, who was my fellow last year, um, we started this right after the first surge, and we continued this with Amar Motlu, my, my current fellow. And so what I'm showing you here is the regular papillary architecture of usual PTC or classical PTC. Um, what you see to the right is sort of a tracing of the architecture, and it, it could look like um, a villus a chorionic villi from a placenta. They're not complex. They have few secondary papillae. In contrast, um, this is what the hypercomplex pattern looks like in tall cell variant of PTC. So it seems to be forming these papillae that are very complex. They're interdigitating. And it's probably because of these um, long arborizing secondary papillae. And we see here in the inset again from, from this tumor um, confirming that these are tall cells. Now, what happens if you have a large tumor? Three is not particularly large, five, seven slides. How do you give an accurate assessment of tallness? If it's 30%, if it's 10%, if it's 50%, all of these, um, all of these cut points matter. So um, you have so much you can have so much heterogeneity within the tall cell component from slide to slide, and also heterogeneity within the size of the tumor. How do you do this? Well, um, this is how we do it, and let me tell you, it's loads of fun, um, and it's easier to do when you have it when you're working digitally. But basically, you, I start a spreadsheet of all the slides and the largest. Um, uh, diameter for each of the case uh, for each slide and the purpose of this is to be able to normalize the percent contribution of the tallness then again you go low power and then high power slide by slide and estimate the tallness slide by slide and what you're doing with this um, normalization factor is so what I do for instance is I, I've got these different measurements and I set one of the measurements to one so everything else becomes a, a relative to either the largest or the smallest, whichever one you want to set up. And so here, for instance, um, whatever contribution I find in slide B will only contribute 
5% um, of the tallness. And in slide C, whatever contribution I find, because slide C has 60% of what you see in slide A, that'll contribute 60%. Go through the slides again, and here's, what I, here's the estimates I come up with, 30, 45, and 20. And here's how you add it up. 30% times one, 45% times modified like by 90%, 20 modified by 60%. You sum it up and you divide it over the number of slides. So in this case, um, you estimate it as tall cell features. Now, this is a work in progress that we have not yet um, published. And in interest of time, I can't go through the whole study. But I want to get back to the question of, can you find tall cells in primary to metastatic tall cells in primary tumors where the primary tumor does not is not classifiable as tall cell. And what do you do with that? So um, here, this represents a random re-review of 113 PTC patients with positive lymph nodes taken from this cohort of 380 PTC patients that um, we're following. And the definition that I used in terms of cytology was height was at least twice the time, uh, width. What we also did here is we looked at two different distribution cutoffs, 30% cutoff and the 50% cutoff. So what I'm showing you here is that whichever distribution of uh, whatever cut point definition you use for tall cell variant of PTC, the, med the tall cell component in the lymph nodes is consistent with the primary tumor. This is the control group, which is defined as less than 10%. And the majority of, tum of patients with metastatic PTC who are in the control group, majority have uh, tall cell metastatic tall cell components that are also limited, so consistent with the primary. In only three patients did we see metastatic tall cells more than 50%, and then there were no occurrences in, in that group. Now, the interesting group is, is quite, the, the middle group is quite interesting. What I'm showing you here is the tall cell, uh, PTC with tall cell features. And of course, there's two arms because it depends upon which cut point you're gonna be using. So about half of the patients with, that were diagnosed as tall cell, PTC tall cell features had metastatic components that were above the, the threshold that was, that was relevant. So half of them were, and we have, um, we have outcome known um, for majority of these patients, and about a third of patients, no matter how you define may define the, the the category, about a third of a third of these patients did go on to develop recurrence um, or had persistence. So that's very interesting. And you'll see in the um, following slides a notation like this: plus thir uh, 30 plus and 50 plus. That means when we were looking at the at associations with our group. Um, we used this cut point, which, which denotes inclusion of these patients who are upgraded from tall cell feature. So I'm not gonna go over all of our, our outcome studies, uh, outcome results, but I do wanna show you that disease recurrence was associated with PTC in the subgroup for any patient with extra, any degree of extra thyroid extension. And here it was the cut point of 30 plus versus the control group. Now, um, we can answer the question, we cannot answer the question at this time, which cut point is better. Um, we also found that tall cell uh, PTC was associated with aggressive lymph node status. I don't think, it, and that's aggressive lymph node status as uh, defined by the American Thyroid Association Risk of Recurrence uh, strata. Um, I don't think that that's been reported before. And here it was a cut point of 50% uh, plus. Now, I, um, I hope that I've convinced you, um, and Dr. Lavolsi has convinced you, that there must be a better way. Um, there's so many problems with uh, which definitional cut point to use, how to, how to, to recognize a category, um, et cetera, et cetera, that there really must be a better way of, um, of making a diagnosis. And so um, a computational approach appears to be ideal. Um, if one could develop a computational pipeline to recognize PTC, tall cell variant of PTC, it would first of all be robust, it would be reproducible, it would have the ability to look over large data sets um, and look at different cut points. Importantly, um, 
a, cup, a, a definitional cut point could be established based on outcome, not based on arbitrary um, categories that have been defined by pathologists. Um, and so this is what we've been doing for, uh, for the last couple of years. Unfortunately, uh, it's all still a work in progress, so I'm just going to show you some brief stuff. What you see here in the bottom panel, um, panel A, is, um, is a tall cell PTC that's stained with beta-catenin. So beta-catenin routinely stains cell membranes in PTC and retains the, stains them strongly. We'll come back to this later. And so we've used this as an initial, um, as for initial cell segmenting um, um, uh, programs that allow us to, to look at cell geometry. And so what we're seeing in panel B are green cells, which have been segmented out by MATLAB programming. And the green cells represent tall cells. The red cells represent cells, uh, PTC cells that are recognized that are not tall. Um, it looks good, but there are problems with this technique. And part of the problem is that there's a lot of overlapping in um, with PTC tall cells, and it's it's very hard to get complete um, segmented cells uh, that that can be separated into, separate into individual cells. Um, now, if you if you look at PT at tall cell variant of PTC as a um, from a from a um, computational point of view, you see that many tall cells are really within uh, stratified layers of cells and they're overlapping. They have indistinct cell boundaries. So on one hand, this is really not amenable to this geographic approach that I've described to you. But on the other hand, all pathologists are recognizing tall cell. It is something, it is something highly significant. What are we recognizing if we can't really recognize the tallness of cells? We think we are, maybe we're not. So maybe this is all a kind of pattern recognition that is, is um, something yet that we haven't defined and really is not rigidly um, tied to the, to the definition of tall cells. And so using a deep learning um, pattern recognition approach may actually be um, preferable or, or in combination with a, with a geogra geometric approach. And so this is just work in progress. We, this shows you a first pass of a, of a um, AI classifier that recognizes PTC versus non-PTC within a PTC tumor. And we developed a second cl uh, pass classifier that can segment out groups of cells. It would be nice if you could segment out single cells, but I we've tried that and I think that's not gonna be a successful approach. So we're planning to put in for an R21 to get more data. And all I can tell you is stay tuned, work in progress. So I'd like to move on to a different topic that Dr. Volsi did not um, cover. And I think this is gonna be my last topic. Um, and that's a solid variant of PTC, um, also called paraganglioma-like variant or Chernobyl variant. Uh, as Dr. Volsi mentioned, it's common in children, but can be seen in adults. And what I'd like to show you is just a nice case of a 13-year-old girl. She presented with a midline neck mass which was excised in Cunningham Hospital, Birmingham, Alabama, and that was just down the road from UAB. And it was diagnosed as a parathyroid adenoma, which is like sort of bonehead, frankly. So slides came to me, and um, I showed them to my, to my faculty at a noon consensus conference, and everybody said paraganglioma, because it's really for forming zellbollins. And if you look, it's not that PTC-like. You know, you could, if you get lost in the nuclei, you could see stippling. You know, it's not screaming PTC. On the other hand, the TTF1 really showed a different story. And here by the asterisk, what you see is phases of the moon. But in terms of how PTC-like it looks, it's, you know, you have to think about it. So um, after, the, after she was diagnosed as having a thyroid malignancy, um, this girl received total thyroidectomy, bilateral neck dissection. She had a solid PTC of the isthmus. Um, three of uh, thir th 33 lymph nodes were positive, one just under uh, uh, three centimeters with uh, extranodal extension. And um, mutationally, this had a RET PTC3 mutation, rearrangement. She had no BRAF, RAS, RET PTC1, or PAX8, uh, PAX PPR gamma, 
uh, mutations. Um, well, thank you, Todd Stevens, also a former fellow who gave, who helped me get the follow-up. Uh, in 2011, she had positive lymph node, was treated um, twice with alcohol ablation, and as of October 2020, uh, no evidence of structural disease and trace thyroglobulin. Um, I happened at, at, to speak to her father at the time of initial, um, uh, after I changed the diagnosis, and um, uh, it was very meaningful because he said to me, you know, that diagnosis of thyroid cancer changed her whole course, you know? And uh, I, I really had this moment, you know, like, like all pathologists have when we, when we are um, blessed with seeing the, the outcome of our work. Anyway, I think in the interest of time, I would love to talk to you about loss of PTC-ness, but in the interest of time, do you agree, Mark, that uh, I'll, I'll stop it there? Um Margie, I think if you would like, you can. Uh, I, I can yield the floor okay. um, for for three minutes, and then I think we've got one important question uh, that we'll finish up with. You got it. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the issues that um, Dr. Lavolsi had discussed in in this article was about the so-called high-grade carcinoma. And in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is show you something that we call loss of PTCness. Um, we haven't published this yet, um, but I, ha I have a feeling, and Virginia, I'd love to hear what you have to say, that this loss of PTC-ness is, is really another example of what would be called high-grade PTC if there were such a category of high-grade PTC. And so I use this in the, in the following context. You have PTC with no necrosis. So you have no um, reason to upgrade it to poorly diff. There's no findings of anaplastic. Of course, we're all concerned about that. But there are regions of increased nucleopleomorphism and loss of the PTC phenotype. Um, what I've also found is that there's always some kind of abnormality with respect to either P53, key 67 being up, um, uh, up expressed, or some loss of TTF1 expression or loss of beta catenin expression. And so I'll show you examples. Um, here we see some uh, within a PTC, we see areas of these squamoid um, metaplasia, squamous metaplasia. And if you look at the nuclei, well, they're not bad enough to call anaplastic, in, in my opinion, um, but they certainly don't have stopped looking like PTC. The, um, I can't see here, but this is what is, oh, the key 67. So the key 67 in this case was elevated, but not to the level that you would expect with anaplastic. Neither was the P53 elevated to what you would expect in the level of anaplastic. Um, this is an example of another case where we see um, uh, normal TTF1 expression here, where I'm showing you with my arrow, and here you see um, a loss of TTF1. Now, beta catenin was something that we kind of lucked into because of our work um, with, with uh, cell segmentation. And so this is the pattern that you would normally see in a PTC. You'd see very strong, robust cytoplasmic expression. And here we see in areas where we have loss of cytoplasmic expression. Um, and so we've seen this loss of PTC-ness um, in high stage tumors. Um, these are tumors that we call born T4 because we have evidence that at initial surgery they were T4, but in some of these cases, we don't have all of the data, so we say we suspect or we're not sure if it's born T4. But this is one example of a lady. Um, she had her initial surgery in 2013 of a bilateral uh, sclerosing PTC um, with extensive uh, extrathyroid extension, and so she may have been. T4 at presentation. In 2018, she had an aggressive T, uh, laryngectomy, aggressive surgery because of, the, of further progression. Um, again, there was no necrosis, but this loss of PTCness and no features of anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. So here we have a rather routine looking PTC um, associated with a very aggressive course. So there's got to be something more. You know, it, it can't be that, you know, oh, this is just a routine PTC that's growing into the trachea. And so this is an example of what I call loss of PTC-ness, where we see the strand-like pattern, certainly not um, common for PTC. And in the strand-like pattern, we see a decrease in beta-catenin here in the top of, of the screen. 
And um, if you look at high power, this is not a frozen section slide. So it's, so it's what you're looking at is not that kind of um, artifact that you'll see in, in a frozen section control. Um, and we do have increased nuclear pleomorphism. Um, in my mind, uh, calling something PTC requires a greater degree of pleomorphism. And also, you would like to have the P53 and Key 67 back you up, but not always. Here's another example of a woman who had a, a, a hemithyroidectomy in 2010. And in 2017, she came for um, partial or total, I remember, laryngectomy and tracheal resection. Again, we see these um, elongating, infiltrating tubes. It's certainly not the pattern of a usual PTC. And again, if you look at the nuclei, um, they don't look like the nuclei of a typical PTC. So um, this is a group of patients that we've put together, um, and they're united by the fact that they've all had very aggressive um, uh, tracheal laryngeal resections. Oops. Um, one patient actually uh, did have progression to anaplastic, so we can take her out of that group, but this phenotype of loss of PTC-ness um, is common. So um, I'd like to leave it there and hear what, what uh, Dr. Lavolsi has to say about that. Virginia, I'll, I'll defer to you, uh, and, and maybe we'll have we'll be able to have time for one question here at the end. Okay, as uh, with regard to your last uh, group of cases, um, I have seen this pattern, this sort of infiltrative it's nine pattern. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, um, and uh, but I've I've seen it retrospectively in patients who come. Uh, who are diagnosed with anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. And you go back, and you didn't show this, but in the cases that I've seen, often these foci of squamoid stuff will have a lot of hemorrhage associated with them, and it's not near an FNA tract or anything else like that. I think it's a progression. And the, the fact that you had one out of your five cases that did have bona fide AATC uh, is, is okay with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so right now, um, when I report this, it's basically in terms of, well, I have no criteria to call it um, un uh, undifferentiated, uh, 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 anaplastic undifferentiated. I have no criteria to call it poorly differentiated, but you know, this is an aggressive PTC. And, uh, and we leave it at that. In, but, you know, um, you, in, the, you, in the yeah. final moment, if I could just ask both of you, there are times when we will see um, get molecular information uh, as part of the initial workup on a patient, and our findings suggest on site on um, that molecular workup that we are dealing with a a, a tumor with the potential for a high grade uh, clinical course. However, the histology um, at uh, upon resection does not support a high that of a high grade aggressive malignancy. How do you how do you reconcile those findings, and what's your advice to clinicians on how those patients, um, how we should regard them, how we should treat them, and how we should follow them? Um, I I'm just going to tell you what I think, having seen two cases of follicular uh, neoplasm by FNA. Um, and the FNA was subjected to molecular analysis. And in both cases, there was a TERT promoter mutation, which is a very high risk mutation. And so the molecular opinion was that this was going to be some high grade carcinoma of follicular derivation. Uh, when the lesions came out, and they both came out, and we sectioned them to smithereens, they were both follicular adenomas. So I think at this point, the, the, molecu the, the molecular data needs to be taken in the context of everything else. And we need to go back, in my opinion, to what we know. We know by follow-up, we know by histology, et cetera. And I think that those two patients should, after they have their thyroidectomies, do not need anything but follow-up. Um, we're not going to suddenly say, oh, this has a bad molecular signature, therefore we have to do, you know, hemihedectomy. No, I think you have to go by what you know. And what you know is the pathology, the histology, 
and the history of what lesions that look like this under the microscope have done, i.e. nothing. So who knows? You know, I, I personally don't believe in follicular carcinoma in situ, but maybe molecular analysis will change my mind. And that there are already at the molecular level, it's carcinoma, but it's not carcinoma at the clinical level yet. Great. No problem. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, um, we are past our uh, time period, and, I'm for, and I know that we could um, go on for quite some time here and talk about um, areas of, uh, um, of concern and question. I want to thank every, our speakers, first of all, for an outstanding um, discussion this morning. I'd also like to thank all of our um, folks in attendance here. I uh, um, hope that everybody has a uh, safe and wonderful weekend and look forward to you uh, joining us again next week. Um, and uh, and, um, and uh, hopefully everybody will be vaccinated in the very near future. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Take Thank good you. care. Stay safe. Thank you.